Um, so, um, yeah, my name is Stefan Wittermeyer. Um, sorry for not looking into the camera all the time uh, because the window for me is on that side. So uh, it's it's one of these technical things. Um, you see, I'm a dinosaur. Um, you see my email address at, at the bottom of this page and it'll, it'll be on the last page um, too. Um, feel free to contact me after the talk if you have any questions or want to discuss anything. Um, I'm always um, looking forward to that. So on the right side, you see uh, Zach uh, Daniel, um, who is the founder of the, sec uh, of the uh, Ash Framework. And on the left side, you see me. Um, one of the key things about the Ash Framework is that there's the idea of um, having one um, consistent tool set where um, you can um, interact within. So this is uh, this is uh, the, the quote. I'm I'm just reading that now. Uh, when the various components of the system can have consistent expectations of how the other components around them work, you can ultimately do a significant amount of more with this. So, as with any framework, we have a set of rules, and we follow these rules. And by that, the framework offers us an extreme amount of uh, automation and um, faster development. So for me, a framework is all about fast development and easy onboarding of new developers. Uh, but that's just for me. Um, everybody, uh, your mileage may, may vary. So everybody uses it for a, for a different reason, but that's for me the key uh, to make the developer life easier. Um, so this is the homepage of the Edge Framework, and the most important part is this uh, sentence here. We model the domain, and then the framework derives the rest. So to give you an idea, I show you a couple of code examples, and uh, feel free to ask questions um, in the chat, which I cannot see, so I will answer them after the talk. Um, and all the code source, uh, all the source code examples are on that URL you see on the bottom. And uh, the slides, I will upload the slides to my speaker deck account. So the main or the most important part of this whole idea is the resource. Let's do a very, very simple to-do task resource. So on this one, let me um, show you this. Um, we have the... Postgres table here, and we have the attributes here. So what we do here is we say there's an attribute content, and that's a string. Um, so first thing is we do an Edge Postgres create, and then an Edge Postgres migrate, which does the whole migration in the database. After that, we have this content in the database. Um, so there's an ID, which is always automatically, and it's a UUID. Um, it's, and there's a, a content, um, and that's a data text, a data type of text. And right now, that can be null. If we don't want that to be able to be null, um, we can add this allow, allow nil here. Um, and we can um, add a position to. So um, I like to have a position in the, on any to-do list to sort the uh, different items. Uh, and again, for that, allow nil too. So next step is um, same idea. We do, we do run a migration. And um, after that, we have different database or a different table um, we have we still have the text content but let me uh, the noodle bit part changed so right now we can be sure that there's that there won't be any entry um, without content 
And in my experience, that's this kind of validation is key to any um, healthy application because um, users will enter wrong data. Um, we can test this now on the command line or in the in the IEX uh, with this um, command task dot create, and um, we see the result here. Um, so let me just, this is the kind of data we get from the edge framework. Um, and that's pretty easy to understand. This is the same in the, in the database, just to show you what the database does. And uh, here are a couple of commands um, you can do, you can use on your, in your daily life. Um, if you just do a read, you will always get an okay, comma, and then um, the data. If you do anything with an um, uh, with this sign, which I which I forgot the English name for that, um, you get only the data, no okay or a no 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 error. Um, so you can go both ways, um, whatever you prefer. And here's an example for that. Um, so on the top, we have the, just the read, which um, creates an OK comma uh, tuple. And uh, below there's um, the read, um, and th that creates just the data set. Of course, we need some sort of relationship. So uh, to give you an example of how this, this works, um, I'm using this. We, um, we are having an, an, a category and a product, and uh, a product belongs to a category. So for that, we need two resources. We need the category resource, and um, that consists of the name. And as always, we need some sort of ID. Um, these parts here are to tell the framework that we would like to have a create and a read easily accessible by a code um, within our working environment. Um, we can use the framework otherwise too, but uh, with these actions, it's um, easier and it's the default way. Uh, if we want to uh, destroy, um, we would have to add this here. Same for update. Then we have to do the, the product. So the first one was a category. Now we have the product. And the product, um, again, same, same idea. Here are the attributes. Uh, that has a name and a price. And we have a relationship, which is a belongs to relationship to the category. Um, and we can, we have this writable attribute, so we can write it. So let's see how that works. Um, in, in this slide, I start up the IEX and I set the aliases to product and category. And I create a fruit. Uh, one second. And I create a fruit. So um, here's a fruit. Uh, fr fr fruit category, fruits, fruits category. Sorry, plural. Sorry for that. And on the next slide, I create um, an orange product, and I set the category ID to fruits dot ID. So this data set gets created. Now we can load that with this command. That can be done automatically too, but this is um, a manual way. So as a result, we see the OK tuple here. And on top, we have the product. Uh, we have the category. And in the bottom, we have the, um, Sorry, I have a technical clinch here with my uh, clinch with my um, 
phone which I which I used to I use I use my phone to um, draw in the sides and the Wi-Fi just dropped. Sorry for that. Um, so uh, we get all the data from the framework which we need. Um, if we want to um, access that by name, this is an example for that. Um, we can use this by the by name or action and the orange and automatically load the category with that. Um, so we get both here. Um, and we can access the category afterwards. So uh, that was belongs to all. There are other relationships, just in a couple of examples. The ones which I use most, uh, which is the has many, many to many, and has one. That's um, how we worked with data um, code-wise. Um, so if we want to present that data, we need some sort of interface for the user. And for me, the default one is always the web interface. And I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm coming from the Rails world. So I'm thinking in scaffolding. Um, and that's for me the easiest way to start a new application. So there's a, a tool to do the scaffolding in Ash2. And um, I can start it with this command here. You see this one on top. And that'll uh, create all the, the controller and all the forms and um, views I need. Uh, obviously, uh, at the end, I have to um, add the resource in the, in the router. So the controller looks like this. Um, and uh, you see, um, this is this is Ash code here. Uh, we would do that differently in a no normal actor environment. Um, and this is all done by the uh, by this generator. So you can use it for your own application, but you get it right away, uh, and it's working. And this is one of the examples for that's. Uh, let me see. Uh, that's that's a. Uh, that's a show view. Um, so let's have a look at the uh, web page. Um, here we have uh, the index view of these tasks with the um, item which I already created. This is the way how to create new items within the GUI. And one of the key things is validations. So um, it's all built in. Uh, and because I said that these these fields uh, cannot be nil, um, if we try to submit that form, we all we we automatically get uh, these errors here. Same on the command line. Uh, if I try to um, create an empty task, I will get um, uh, two different uh, error messages, and the first one is. Um, content is required. So that's the web uh, GUI. There are two different uh, scaffoldings. Uh, one is the static HTML page and the other one is the uh, live view one. Uh, both work the same way. Um, and uh, both are very good starting points. And again, these are just starting points. Um, not everybody likes to use these. Um, I want to say most people don't, um, but again, I'm uh, I used to be a Rails guy, so for me this is always the first thing to do. Um, next step in for for some applications would be some sort of API to the external way, uh, world, and API is a bit tricky because um, for, uh, Ash framework uses the term API internally in a different way. So if you if you read documentation about Ash and you stumble upon the terminology API, uh, that is not always the external JSON or whatever API. Most times that's the internal API, um, which is used to access the internal resources. So just a heads up if you stumble upon that. Yeah. The JSON uh, API is super easy to set up. Um, How many you, are now? Sorry? 
Um, so I, I just heard somebody, sorry. Um, it's super easy to set up. Um, you um, just have to um, add this router here as a new router. And uh, within the resource, uh, you just have to um, set this, uh, this setup here. Uh, let me draw this here. So if you don't want uh, post or create, you just um, leave that out. Um, it's extremely customizable here, but that's for me the default. Uh, and here's an example how to uh, use that um, JSON API um, through the curl command on the on the on the um, shell. If you are more of a GraphQL API guy, um, that's as easy to do. So both uh, both APIs can be set up within half an hour easily. Um, uh, Graph uh, uh, GraphQL just a different syntax here, but same idea. One of the cool things which are built in, uh, they are not. It's not built in. You have to. Um, um, it's it's a, it's a dependency. You have to uh, install it, but it's easy to use. Is the Ash admin, and there's a great video of uh, Zach, um, the founder uh, and creator of Ash, and um, I link to that video here, uh, where he describes how to uh, use the Ash um, uh, dashboard. Um, and uh, that's a very useful tool for quick interaction on a admin uh, level. So um, having the tools we just discussed is very um, cool and uh, interesting, but um, it's getting much better. Um, you can do calculations. Uh, here's an example where, let me uh, draw this here. Here I do a calculation for a full name in a user resource. So this resource has a first name and a last name, and I want to create another attribute, a virtual attribute, uh, which consists of first name, and last name. Uh, and I can do this uh, within the uh, resource automatically. And I can tell the resource to always build this because it doesn't do it um, by default. And let's see how that works out. Um, here we see the result. So it created an attribute full name from my first name and my last name. And the very cool thing is, it doesn't do that on in Elixir, it does it in SQL. So we asked the SQL database to do that work for us because it's way faster if the database does that. Um, and that's a very useful um, tool um, I'm, I'm, I'm using very often um, and it's super fast. Next thing, um, policies. Uh, let me show you an example. And it's I cannot dive very deep into this here because it's it's kind of complicated, but it's super powerful. So until now we have a we, we have an application where we have data and we can present the data and we can uh, interact the data, but we didn't have any sort of authentication, any sort of policies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's an uh, Ash authentication um, part you can install, and then you get authentication in the system. So you have a current user, and then you can use this information um, with a policy uh, setup. So you can say uh, the owner of a task, for example, can change the task or can delete this the task, and everybody else can read that task but cannot edit it. And you can, and automatically this can be done uh, on the web GUI and on the JSON uh, API or any other API. So that's the key thing and the key idea. You have one truth, uh, which is in the resource uh, or here in the policies. And the whole framework takes care of all the interactions with the other parts. Um, 
And that's super powerful and, and saves so much time and um, reduces uh, errors in a, in a great way because you only have to touch it at one place. So here again, policies work for the web GUI and the external APIs. So the Edge framework does cover a lot, way more than I did here. I just wanted to give you ideas um, how to how, how the basic thinking is. Um, and I just want to make you curious about that. Um, to be honest, the documentation uh, is not always easy to work with. So there's a, there's, there's a big amount of documentation, but it's not always beginner's friendly. Um, I tried to create um, a basic tutorial for the uh, absolute basics, and this is the URL here. Um, and I will upload the speaker deck slides here too. Um, so you can walk through the examples I um, uh, I presented uh, and um, uh, work with them. Uh, and if you want to uh, ask questions to Alexia developers, um, you want to go to the Alexia forum, uh, to Alexia forum where um, all the core team is um, available on a daily basis. So um, answers are very quick to get. Um, and um, if you have any other things, um, the usual way like GitHub, uh, GitHub uh, issues or bug reports, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a it's a classic open source system and a, a classic open source um, ecosystem. So that's um, my quick introduction into um, into Edge. Um, do we have any questions? And how can I see the questions? Um, feel free, anyone feel free to write the questions or if, uh, since we're done with the talk, you can actually unmute and ask any question that you have. And again, Write down my email address. Feel free to send me an email. I know it's uh, sometimes the questions come up like five minutes after the talk. Um, no, no problem. Just send me an email. Um, there's a chat. Let me see. Are there any guides to assist in deployment? Um, not really, because that's not an, an Edge problem. Uh, that's an, a, a Phoenix uh, or Elixir problem. Um, deployment with like with any any other framework uh, is um, easy if you use the like the big players. Uh, like uh, if you're doing that on um, on Fly.io, it's super easy. Um, or uh, Heroku, same thing. Uh, but these are the more expensive. Versions. If you want to do that on uh, on your own server, you really have to find um, uh, tutorials for that. Um, it's doable. I do that all the time, but it's uh, as um, complicated um, as it doesn't have to be. Um, I hate that. Uh, I would I would like to have easier deployments, uh, but that's the same with other frameworks. Like was I'm coming from the rates world, and that's the same problem there. Uh, second question uh, from Howard. Um, does Ash allow the timestamps that are easy in normal Elixir? Um, yeah, uh, it does. Um, I don't have the uh, syntax uh, in uh, in my brain, but uh, it's easy to do. Um, where do you put your own business logic? Um, normally, you put that uh, as uh, actions in the um, in the resource. Um, so the interesting part here is that once you set that up, set it up, you can you, you can use the uh, external APIs to to trigger that um, business logic. So you can uh, create some sort of action where you say, for example, I like a post, and then you ca you cannot only like that post from your web GUI, but also from your JSON or whatever other um, API, and that's very powerful. Any other questions? Uh, Howard again, is there a, 
uh, Ash PhD Gen Auth to integrate Auth? Uh, yes, there is. Um, uh, the question is, um, how easy is it to integrate authentication with Ash? Um, that's pretty easy, but um, uh, only if you do the default out of the box uh, system. Once you want to customize that, it's getting a little bit tricky. So if you um, you will probably find a couple of questions of of, my, of, of me in the Alexia forum about that problem. Um, because uh, I always want to customize my authentication and uh, add stuff like uh, that. The, the, the default is uh, email address and password. And uh, I, for example, like to add a username for that. Um, but that's uh, all doable. Um, it just takes a little bit more work. Um, but again, the Alexia forum is a great uh, way of getting help for that. So, uh, Ashraf, uh, so is Ash API first product based uh, does it support multiple vendor databases um yes it does support um, multiple uh, vendor databases it uses actors or uh, another word. so everything you can do with acto you can do with um within the ash uh, ecosystem um what do you mean by ash api first product based And feel free to use the mic too. Um, Ashraf, maybe if you can. Um, Specify the question a bit further. Or any other question? Okay. Um, because it, I'm just reading the question. It, because it triggers business logic using API only, which is usually the HTML. Um, yeah. Um, I'm not super familiar with the wording here, so uh, I'm on, on, on very thin ice. Um, you want to ask uh, somebody of the of the core team. Um, I think there's a second question that he also posted. Does it support multiple vendor databases? Yes, it does. Uh, um, it, it does. Again, a, a, any uh, any um, database which can be accessed with uh, Ecto um, can be accessed with, with Ash2 and uh, multiple uh, databases at the same time, no problem. I've never seen it, but it's not a problem. Anyone with any other question, you can gladly say it's unmute and ask it out loud. Um, as Stefan just mentioned, uh, he's certain that some of the questions are going to pop up in your question maybe five minutes into after this particular talk. He has his email written down. Uh, you can always send him a question and he'll be gladly, he'll gladly uh, share, respond. There's also a question here by Peter. Uh, he's apologizing, he joined a bit late, but what exactly is the purpose? The purpose of Ash is to minimize the initial boilerplate um, footprint. So uh, we all know that uh, any new application we do a lot of stuff in the beginning, like authentication, et cetera, et cetera, uh, which takes forever to implement and um, which doesn't make any sense to reinvent the wheel all the time. So Ash provides us with the tools to do that easily. Um, and that's, in my opinion, the biggest advantage to have this um, strict set of um, tools I'm using. So um, whenever I onboard a new team member, I tell him or her, okay, we are using Ash. And if it's, if that's an Ash developer, he or she will know autumn, uh, already 
um, how it's done and uh, where to search for this stuff. Um, so uh, that's my biggest advantage. And the next thing is I like the whole um, um, the whole policy idea where you set up one policy uh, and it, it goes through the whole uh, stack and all the APIs. Um, that's very, very powerful and uh, reduces um, potential errors um, in a big in a big time. Um, so next one. Uh, what are some use cases currently implement using it? Um, I, I have no idea which company is using Ash. Um, you want to go to the uh, ask the core team. Maybe they have a list. Um, I don't know. I, I, I've seen a couple of companies uh, using that, um, but I have no list for that. It's the same question with, with, with Phoenix. So who is using Phoenix? A lot of companies do, but I don't know which ones. Any other question? Um, if we do not have any other questions on board, uh, I want to thank you so much for giving it for giving up your time for joining us for this webinar. Um, Stefan, thank you so much for your time. I'm sure everyone here is living more more with more knowledge than what they had before. And for those who still have questions, um, please don't hesitate to actually contact Mr. Stefan. Okay. All right. Thank you. And um, thank you for having me. Uh, I had a great time here. And uh, again, uh, send me an email if you have any, any questions. Uh, there's one last question just before we depart from the call. Do you think the main uh, reason to adopt the uh, do you think the main reason to adopt yeah. development and time force? Yeah, that, that's great. That's that's the main to cut development. Yeah. Let, let me scroll up uh, one second. Uh, um, so the question is, so do you think main reason to adopt it would be to uh, cut development time and force proper governance? Yes. Uh, in my opinion, that's well, that's for me the main reason. Um, because there's nothing the Edge Framework does which I cannot do myself um, in my own way. Um, but as with any framework, like, like the same goes for, for Phoenix. Um, why do I use Phoenix? I, I use Phoenix because it takes, it, it does a lot of the work where it would take me years to implement that myself. Um, uh, so that's the same with the Ash framework. It's It makes life much easier. Um, development time um, gets uh, reduced a lot. So, and then there's another one from Nuku. What the learning curve for someone who, um, who does not know Phoenix or is fresh to that? Ooh, okay. The learning curve for some the curve for someone who doesn't know Phoenix, um, or who is fresh as a web developer in Elixir. Um, um, Nuku, what kind of frameworks did you use in the past? Because if you if you have used something like Ruby on Rails, uh, it'll be easier to uh, to learn Phoenix, and uh, after that Ash. Um, the major thing is if you have never worked with a functional programming language, uh, that can be kind of tricky in the beginning. It took me it took me forever to uh, understand functional programming. Um, I used to be a Ruby and Rails guy, so uh, I used to think in object-oriented uh, uh, programming, and functional programming is a totally different ball game. Um, so that's the first thing. First thing, um, and then uh, Phoenix, um, it does seem to work like Rails, but um, it's 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 way more sophi sophisticated. Um, and uh, not super easy to learn. Uh, so I want to say the, the total learning curve is quite steep in the beginning. I don't want to sugarcoat that. Um, but uh, you get, after that st uh, initial steep learning curve, um, you get a, a lot more productivity, 
Uh, cleaner code. The code is so much cleaner, uh, so much easier to maintain. And it is just super fast. Like any Phoenix application is at least, at the minimum, 10 times faster than uh, the same application built with Ruby and Rails. So that was for me the initial uh, argumentation uh, because uh, I can save so much um, hosting costs and get uh, a faster application with that. Um, and after uh, that was my initial reason to 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 start with Phoenix. Um, the other things just came as a as a bonus. Does it answer your question or any any follow up questions here? Yeah, I am. I had a one or two more questions. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, on that ask. Um, so if you're migrating a code base from Phoenix to Ash, um, what are some of the the uh, what would the process be like? Assuming you want to migrate the code base from probably Phoenix to Ash. Okay, the first thing is um, you would you would uh, think about the resources. So um, if you already have a Phoenix application, um, you did that work by yourself or uh, in advance. You have to translate that thinking into the Ash world. Um, and that would be the first thing. thing. Uh, depending on the complexity of the application, um, do you have something specific in mind? Can you share that or um, is it a very ge generic question? It's more of a generic question. Okay. Um, because in my opinion, and this is my, my personal opinion, um, if it's a small to medium-sized application, I would, I, I again, personally, I would restart in a green field uh, because um, that's most times more efficient than to um, translate an existing application into a new framework or uh, Ash is not a new framework because it's if you if you do Ash with Phoenix you're still using Phoenix, uh, but you just have a different logic uh, in the core. Um, so I, for a small and medium sized application, I would really think about uh, doing it on a green field and learning from mistakes of the past and just do it a new a, a better way. Uh, but that's my personal uh, way of doing this. Uh, for big applications, you have no other uh, other way of uh, than to really do it step by step. Um, but that's totally doable and not a big a big issue itself. It's just um, tedious work. Okay, thank you. And my last question: um, the Ash and Ash and Phoenix, um, how compatible are they? What can what in Phoenix can be used in Ash and what in Ash can be used in Phoenix? Maybe in terms of components or uh, parts of Ash which can be used in Phoenix or vice versa. Are there any, are there, are there any things like that? I don't know if I understand, uh, if I understood your question right. So um, you are asking, um, or let, let, let me, let me, uh, let me describe how Phoenix, uh, Phoenix and Ash interact with each other. Um, uh, you have Phoenix, and on top of Phoenix comes Ash. Uh, and Ash, think of Ash as some sort of, um, and this is going to be, this is not a correct uh, wording, but think of it as a replacement of Actor, which it isn't because it uses Actor on the uh, below. But um, in most applications, you while you're using Ash, you don't interact with Actor anymore. You still can, but um, you don't uh, normally. Um, so that's um, that's a thing. Um, there might be future things um, for future uh, Ash releases where um, this gets a little bit more complicated because um, Zach has some great ideas how to improve things that put it that way, but um, you have to ask the core team for that. Um, I don't know uh, how, how the uh, working will be. Okay, thank you, thank you for the answers. You're welcome. Thank you for, for the questions. So now everybody tell me, where are you? Like the guy in the blue shirt with the fan